from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2000 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Clockwork Genes, Discoveries in Biological Time, will be given by Dr. Michael Rossbash, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Brandeis University, and Dr. Joseph S. Takahashi, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Northwestern University. The fourth lecture is titled, The Mammalian Timekeeper. And now, to introduce our program, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Senior Program Officer, Dr. Dennis Liu. Welcome back for the final lecture in our year 2000 holiday lecture series. Dr. Takahashi's presentation is titled The Mammalian Timekeeper. So far in this series, you've heard about the global forces that have shaped the evolution of circadian rhythms. You've also heard about brilliant work uh, making use of the advanced molecular biology available in fruit flies. And in this lecture, in this next lecture, we'll delve deep into the molecular details of how our own clocks work. This lecture, like the others in our series, features animations developed by a team here at HHMI, and we hope that they're entertaining and illuminating. The animations from this year and previous year's holiday lectures are available on a website that we call biointeractive.org. If you go to biointeractive.org, you'll find lots of interactive demonstrations, other animations, and virtual laboratories. Joe Takahashi received his PhD in biology from the University of Oregon. And in fact, he graduated just a couple years before I came to Oregon to begin my own graduate studies. At Oregon, uh, Joe worked with Michael Menneker, whose laboratory was devoted to understanding human behavior. And there's really no other way to say it. Mike Menneker's lab was a zoo. Um, it was full of interesting people, and they worked on every conceivable animal, from slugs to uh, bats and from chickens to wolves. And I'd go often to the Menneker lab, even though I worked in a different lab, for conversation, both scientific and otherwise. Um, I'd ask friends of mine who worked in the lab what they were doing, and they'd say things like, I'm doing a melatonin assay, first developed by Joe Takahashi. Um, I'm following up on experiments done by Joe Takahashi. I'm uh, running an experiment on equipment built by Joe Takahashi. And when I asked Mike Menneker about doing a rotation in his lab, he recommended that I read a paper written by Joe Takahashi. Who was this Joe Takahashi guy, I wondered. Well, eventually I got to know Joe personally and to talk science with him directly. And it's always a thrill, which you've had a small taste of this morning. So back in Oregon, we knew that Joe would go on to do great things. And here he is, an HHMI investigator and um, uh, a noted expert in his field. Well, it's time to turn it over to another short video to introduce Joe. And then at the end of our program, President, HHMI President Tom Check will return uh, for some closing remarks. It's hard to imagine a more interesting job because I get to do almost anything I want to do. It's one of those wonderful jobs where uh, you, you have uh, the, the freedom to just pursue uh, interesting problems. And I think it is important for us to try to pursue problems that are, that are important and important to human health. So I think that we, as biologists, um, need to think about how we can sort of try to educate everyone more broadly about why science is important, um, how biology impacts our lives. Someone who's interested in business school or law school should really still have some understanding of uh, biology, I think, and the way that our understanding of the human genome in the future is really going to impact society and how, how we uh, have to live in the future. But what do I think that it takes to be a good scientist? I would say one of the most important ingredients is curiosity. You really have to be um, just naturally inquisitive and curious about the world around you. Um, now that doesn't mean you're going to be a scientist, uh, but I think you have to have this internal sort of drive uh, to try to understand nature and, and what is going on in nature. Uh, I think that's probably fundamental. Um, do you have to be a good student? 
I would say in a traditional sense, no, you don't really. They need to be relatively intelligent, somewhat organized. Um, but I think the most important aspect is drive, is they really have to be motivated to, to understand and answer that question. You really can be um, many different kinds of, uh, of people in science, because science is so diverse. And so I think that there are many opportunities uh, for people who might think that they're not cut out for science. They just need to try it out and, and really find um, some of the opportunities that are really available, you know, to explore it. Hello, it's great to be back. I wanted to uh, thank Dennis Liu and his staff for the uh, incredible job that they've done this year uh, in helping Michael and I out, and also Ann Sutherland and her staff in putting together this production, which has really been a learning experience for Michael and I, I can assure you. Uh, in this second lecture, I'd like to now turn to the mammalian story again. And if we could begin with that first uh, short animation, I want to take you back to my first lecture in which we reviewed the idea that we have a clock in our brain and that our eyeballs receive light information. It's carried down to the optic nerve, into the base of the hypothalamus, into these two wing-like structures, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which are composed of thousands of neurons that operate in a network uh, each of the neurons fires during the daytime, and indeed in vivo, all the neurons fire in synchrony together to fo form a circadian output. And as we've heard yesterday and today, the basic mechanism of this uh, cell uh, feedback loop occurs in the cell. So today what I'd like to do is to really review for us what we have uh, tried to understand in mammals. And I take you back to this slide of Ron Kanopka and Seymour Benzer. Uh, because throughout my own career, uh, which began in the early 80s or late 70s actually, uh, we always were interested in trying to understand what molecules compose the biological clock in mammals. But we are frustrated in our efforts to find and get our hands on those molecules. And it was really not until Ron Kanopka's discovery of the period gene, or mutant, that uh, we had a new approach to try to understand what these molecules uh, might be composed of. And so following the cloning of the period and timeless uh, genes in the 80s and 90s, we began to turn our attention to genetic approaches, which were really uh, trailblazed by Seymour Benzer and Ron Kanopka. And because we were not able to clone the period gene in mammals, even though it had been cloned in flies in 1984, it was very difficult. It turns out the sequence is quite divergent. Uh, what we decided to do was to go back and actually do what Ron Kanopka did but this time to use a mouse instead of a fly. And that was to find mutants in uh, mice that have uh, timing defects. And so this next slide shows uh, one of my favorite etchings from Barry Moser uh, of the Queen Mouse from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, to illustrate our favorite organism in the laboratory today, about 10 years ago, we switched to the mouse as a genetic model system uh, because arguably mice and humans, ironically, are the best experimental or mammalian uh, model systems for doing genetics. Um, what we did, shown in the next slide, was to create random mutations in the germline of mice. And the way you do this is you treat them with a chemical, ethyl nitrosourea, or ENU. You inject male mice, it makes them go sterile, but then they recover fertility a few weeks later. When they do, those germ cells are mutagenized. And you can then cross this mutagenized male to normal female mice to produce a first generation of mice that are carrying 
uh, gametes that were mutagenized in this mouse here. Okay? And so we call these generation one mice, which are carrying heterozygous mutations randomly throughout the whole genome. So in our first screens, uh, which were done uh, with my very close colleague, Bill Dove, at the University of Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, we initiated a genetic screen together with Larry Pinto and Fred Turek at Northwestern uh, to search for mice that might have abnormal rhythms. And so here's an activity record which you've seen many of. This is a record of a mouse in the screen that looks normal. It has a normal pattern of uh, running at night and a short, shorter period uh, in darkness. And in fact, this histogram here shows you the period values for the first 300 mice that we screened. And you can see that the average is about 23.7 hours, just like this mouse here. And the distribution is very tight. Okay. But a single mouse, mouse number 25, in fact, it was the 25th mouse that we screened, had a very abnormal pattern. It was about one hour longer on average, as you can see here. It's way out here, six standard deviations away from the mean. And this is the record of mouse number 25. It had a clock that was one hour slower. Now, um, the important issue, of course, is whether this is really truly a mutation and can it be transmitted to the progeny of this mice. And we do this by test crossing. So we would take this mouse number 25, luckily it was a male, cross it to normal females and ask in the progeny of that cross, uh, can we see this mutant phenotype again? And the answer was yes. And indeed, half of the offspring were mutant and half were normal, which was consistent with the notion that this mouse was carrying a single gene mutation and that it had only one mutant copy of whatever allele that might be, this 50-50 distribution. Uh, the other conclusion we can make uh, early on here is that the mutation appears to be dominant. And the reason we say that is, that, uh, is the way we did the screen uh, only half or only one uh, allele has been mutagenized in all of these mice. So any mutation we detected in this particular screen uh, must be dominant. Now when we um, crossed heterozygotes, mice that look like this, to then try to produce our first homozygous mutant animal, okay, um, this is actually uh, a record of the first litter that we obtained uh, in such a cross that could have produced a homozygote. And so in such a cross, you would predict a one to two to one Mendelian ratio of one quarter wild type, two quarters heterozygotes, and one quarter homozygous mutant. And that is exactly what we got incredibly. So here is a wild type mouse. These are two heterozygotes, and this is a homozygous mutant. We named the mutation clock uh, based on its uh, phenotype. And interestingly, the homozygous mutant phenotype is much more extreme than the heterozygous phenotype. That is, the mice have a 28-hour period, which, which is hard to see here upon release in constant darkness, which then degrades and they completely lose their circadian rhythm. Uh, because we can see a difference between heterozygotes and homozygotes, and because heterozygotes are sort of intermediate between wild type and homozygous mutant, we call uh, this kind of mutation semi-dominant. We can uh, actually see the phenotypic consequences of uh, the mutant allele even as a heterozygote. Okay? Now, in the next slide, um, we did a very interesting experiment with Eric Herzog and Gene Block at the University of Virginia in which we looked at the single cell phenotype from cultured SCN neurons uh, using this planar microelectrode array technique that I talked about yesterday. 
And you might recall that using this measurement, we, can, we could show that individual SCN cells were themselves competent circadian pacemakers. And so in this experiment, what we've done is to look at cells taken from the three different clock genotypes of mice and ask, uh, what is the effect of the clock mutation at the level of single cells? And the answer is, as we saw before, in wild types, the wild type rhythm has an average period, this is the period of the cells in culture, that is almost identical to the average period of the animal's behavior in vivo, okay, 23.6 or 23.7. In heterozygotes, the period is one hour longer, and indeed, these individual cell rhythms are on average one hour longer. This is incredible to see this correspondence of the phenotype between a single cell and a whole organism. And indeed, in homozygous mutants, SCN cells actually fail to generate persistent circadian rhythms and uh, are really consistent with the loss of rhythm phenotype that we see at the level of the whole organism. So this uh, set of experiments strongly suggested to us that this uh, mutation was very interesting. It's a very extreme phenotype, 28-hour period and loss of rhythm. And so, of course, we wanted to understand uh, or to know what the gene was. And uh, back in 1994, when we had fully characterized the clock mutant, uh, the Human Genome Project had just begun, and we were uh, incredible benefactors of resources from that project because Eric Lander had just produced the first genetic map of the mouse in 1992. And as the resources for that map uh, was generated, we used those markers immediately. It was almost perfect timing. And so to actually identify and find the gene we used a technique that is very common now in trying to identify human disease loci that are caused by single genes. And this method is called positional cloning. What we do is to map the location of the mutant phenotype using DNA markers. And initially, we could easily find that it was on chromosome 5 of the mouse. And then with higher and higher resolution, we could then zone in or zoom in on where on mouse chromosome 5 the clock mutant might be located. And what we could say at this point is it had to be somewhere between here and here, and eventually we reduced it to these two markers so that we argued genetically that the mutation must be here, somewhere in here. Okay? Now, the important next step is to go from a genetic map to a physical map, that is, physical pieces of DNA. And in the early uh, and late 90s, uh, there were a few different ways of cloning large segments of DNA. But uh, one of these, which are called yaks, uh, not that furry animal, but are actually uh, yeast artificial chromosomes, uh, these were one way of physically cloning very large segments of DNA. And in the green are shown a set of la uh, yak clones that overlap this region. And indeed, um, at this point, the entire lab, because it uh, was such an intense effort, had to get together and work as a team. And many different people took on various aspects of this job. Uh, and I think in, in my lab, it was a very uh, um, important uh, feature that they were actually quite friendly and social. And for example, uh, to give you an example of some of the fun they had in the lab, they actually made clock beer out of one of the yeast strains. In fact, this yeast strain right here, yeast number 55, was actually used to make the beer that you find in this bottle here. And they also made their own private label, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> And so I saved my bottle for posterity. Now, at the same time, we used a different cloning vector, bacterial artificial chromosomes, or BACs, to 
cover this region also. And these turned out to be nice resources because the sizes were smaller, they're much easier to work with. And what we did with um, Bax was to take an alternative approach, and that was to try to rescue the mutation. This was actually uh, first done with the period gene in 1984 and 85 by Michael Rosbash, Jeff Hall, and Mike Young's lab to show that a particular segment of DNA contained the period locus. And so we actually used the same strategy uh, with clock mutant mice. And what we did was to create transgenic mice that might be carrying these large segments of back DNA by microinjection into the pronucleus. And so in these kinds of experiments, you'll get mice that carry and integrate this DNA and then can transmit it to their progeny. Uh, after crossing those mice, we could then ask what happens when we put this piece of normal DNA into a mutant mouse. It's really a gene therapy experiment in a mouse. And incredibly, what we see here is these are four clock mutant mice that have the long period and loss of rhythm phenotype. And these are four litter mates that are also clock homozygous mutants, but they have this back transgene, and their behavior, circadian behavior, is completely normal. There was a complete restoration of function by this piece of DNA. And so this uh, shows you a current map. Turns out there are about four and a half genes in this region from complete genome sequencing of this region. Um, and these are four back clones that we made transgenic mice out of. And it turns out the yellow clones are the ones that rescued the rhythm. The orange clones <laughs> failed to rescue. And just based on the rescue pattern alone, you could argue or convince yourself that this large gene here must be the clock gene, and indeed it was. Uh, this turned out to be an interesting gene. It's about 100,000 base pairs in size. It has 24 exons. We joke one exon for every hour of the day. Um, and it encodes a very interesting protein. So back in 1997, when we identified the clock protein, only the period and timeless genes were known in Drosophila. And interestingly, both period was shown here and timeless had no obvious DNA binding motifs on them. And so clock was especially appealing at this time because it had a clear basic helix loop helix uh, domain, shown here in the green. And the basic region is known to be a DNA binding domain, uh, as well as the helix loop helix and past domains, which were found incredibly in the period protein, which are protein interaction domains. The final interesting feature of the clock protein was that the C terminus was glutamine rich. And this is a signature of the activation domains of transcription factors. So um, to summarize before I take a question from the house, uh, we used a genetic approach to find a mouse mutant. That mouse mutant then allowed us to identify the underlying gene using the methods of positional cloning and transgenic rescue uh, to identify very interesting protein clock, which is a transcription factor. So if um, I could have the first question from the house, let's uh, try the back of the room right there. Yes, you. Hi, um, Hi I'm Natasha Wilson for the Potomac School. And I was wondering, uh, once research in circadian clocks is uh, sufficiently over um, and you've gotten a general knowledge for uh, how circadian clocks work, um, what, what are you, uh, as researchers, planning on doing with this uh, information, uh, uh, for instance, like with gene therapy or anything like that? Right. So um, I think listening to Michael and I talk, you might have the impression that a lot of things are known. Uh, we have discovered a lot of things, but clearly a lot of things are really not known. And so you should keep it uh, clear in your minds that we have sort of identified a set of genes. I'm going to tell you about the set in mammals. Uh, and so we sort of have a set of players 
but we have very little understanding of how they actually function, how we get 24 hours out of the segment. And so we're making hypotheses to test, uh, but I think just on the clock problem alone, we still have a long way to go in, in understanding mechanism. Um, I think the other interesting feature is uh, how do these apply to human um, conditions. And so at the end of my talk, I'm going to give you an example of that. Uh, finally, I think I'm interested in actually doing some new things. I'm going to use genetics to actually find genes that control other behaviors like learning and memory uh, and more complicated functions. So the next question is from Miami. And my question was, if you can face a fly with a blue light, can you also face a mammal? So the answer is yes. Um, in mammals, uh, blue-green light is actually the most effective light for phase shifting our clocks. Uh, the only um, qualification I need to make with that is in mammals, we don't really know what the photopigment is. And as I'll tell you in the second half of my lecture, cryptochrome is unlikely to be that photoreceptor, uh, as we saw it in flies. Next question is from East Lyme. Go ahead, East Lyme. Hi, my name is Andrew Tishnook, and I'm a sophomore at East Lyme High School. I was wondering, have you done any overexpression experiments with clock? Very good question. And indeed, we have. In those mice that overexpressed the clock locus uh, to be used for rescue, if you, uh, if you express that clock gene on a wild-type background, what we find is that the mice have a shorter period. They get shorter by an hour, in some extreme cases, two hours. Next question is from Moscow. Go ahead, Moscow. Uh, hi, this is, this is Veronica Lysine, number 13. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, uh, what kind of experiment uh, we use uh, to uh, understand interaction of the mutant genes and live genes? Uh, so what kind of experiments do we use to see the difference between mutant genes and wild-type genes? And so uh, in, in the case of the clock mutation, the difference was caused by just a single base pair difference, an A to T transversion. That was it, one change in the DNA. That turned out to be in an interesting place in the clock gene. It was in the five prime splice donor site of an exon in the protein. And that mutation caused that particular exon to be skipped, uh, thus producing a deletion in the middle of the clock protein. And so it was really DNA based. The next question we'll take from the house right here. You said that most, uh, that the clock mutation was a deletion. What type are most other de uh, mutations in other genes that control the biological clock? So most of the mut mutants that were made or have been made in flies and mammals have been made with chemical mutagens that induce point mutations, just single base pair changes. And so many of the mutant uh, mutations are actually single amino acid uh, residue mutations. Uh, but as you saw for the period mutation, that nucleotide actually caused a stop codon in the case of the PER0. And so you can get stop codons. Or in the case of the clock mutation, it causes splicing mutation. So we get a wide variety. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. And so let me continue on uh, with the next slide. So as uh, you already heard from the Drosophila story, the function of the clock protein uh, is really to act as a positive acting transcription factor in concert with its partner, which we call BMAL in mammals. BMAL is the homologue of the Drosophila cycle protein. And they are both basic helix loop helix pass proteins. They form a heterodimer, and they bind to an EBOX motif found in the control region of PER genes. And indeed, uh, we discovered the BMAL protein in a collaboration with Chuck Weitz at Harvard, in which we used an interaction screen using clock in yeast to see what proteins clock would bind to. And BMAL was one of those proteins. Uh, when we then uh, looked at the mammalian version of the period genes, which
uh, had been cloned by two other laboratories in the world, Hajime Tei in Tokyo and Chen Chi Li at Baylor, we actually found that the upstream control regions of the mammalian PER genes control, uh, contain EBOX motifs. And so uh, through biochemical experiments, we could provide evidence for this kind of model that clock and BMAL activate the transcription of the period one gene. Uh, and that indeed in the clock mutant protein, uh, the protein could bind or interact with BMAL, could still bind the E-box, but was somehow defective in activating transcription. So in the uh, last three years or so, through both uh, molecular biology and genomics techniques, uh, we now have a set of nine different proteins that are either clock genes or putative clock genes. And so we have the clock protein here and its partner BMAL1, which are positive acting, activating, acting transcription factors. And then interestingly, in mammals, uh, there are three orthologs of the period protein, which we call PER1, PER2, and PER3. They all share this pass domain. There is also a protein that's similar to the fly timeless gene, but recent experiments suggest that this particular version of timeless may be different from the fly protein. And finally, there are two cryptochrome proteins in mammals, similar in sequence to the cryptochrome proteins in flies. However, as I'm going to show you in a minute, their roles appear to be completely different in mammals. Uh, the ninth protein is casein kinase 1 epsilon, uh, which is similar to the double time mutation that Mike Rosbash talked about. And I'll also be telling you a little bit about casein kinase 1 epsilon. Now, cryptochrome 1 and 2 uh, was really studied by using knockouts in mice. That is a method in which we selectively create a null mutation in these genes. And uh, in experiments done in collaboration with Aziz Sankar and uh, Toto in Japan, we found that cryptochrome mutations did indeed change circadian rhythms in mice. Knocking out the cryptochrome 1 gene caused the period to shorten by about one hour compared to wild type. On the other hand, knocking out the cryptochrome 2 gene caused the period to lengthen about one hour as compared to wild type. But the real surprise came when we made the double mutation of cryptochrome 1 and 2. In these mice, the rhythm in constant darkness was completely eliminated. These mice have no...